Welcome many people along the, the stage here. Arthur Rosenfeld, Mike Gravely, Carl Brown, Jeff Wright. Uh, I'd like to thank Gary Baldwin for organizing the meeting very much today. I'd like to honor a new friend, Bob Weisen Miller, a uh, new California Energy Commissioner. And so as I look around the room, I see a wonderful representation from uh, the Haas School of Business, from the Engineering School, uh, from uh, the... John Zeisman was here for a while from uh, Economics and Public Policy. And so this is the kickoff of the I-4 Energy Center, which later on, uh, in a more frivolous manner, will be celebrated over cake and ribbon cutting on the fourth floor of this building. So when we're finished with the uh, proceedings at uh, 1 o'clock or just after, uh, please drift up uh, to, the, to the fourth floor, and Gary and his team have a way of getting everybody up there quickly. I-4 Energy... Uh, is especially focusing on the information technology of the demand side of energy. Uh, the most obvious projects are in smart buildings and in sensors for the grid, the kind of work that's done in BSEC. Uh, but yesterday, uh, I had the honor also of chatting with Michael Hanneman, who is in our Golden School of Public Policy, and I came to realize, I must confess for the first time, that the peer organization, Mike's uh, peer organization, is also funding a lot of work to do with the, uh, the sea levels and the impact on the environment, uh, where, where the Bay Area is also a, a big part of their study. So peer has funded much of the work that's been going on in the past in this I-4 energy program. We sincerely hope that that relationship will continue, but peer has a bigger footprint than I ever imagined myself on this campus. And so I think the Citrus environment is the perfect place to bring, bring people like John Zeisman, Michael Hanneman, the public policy people, the law professors that we met yesterday, and the economics professors that were on a panel yesterday. So the I-4 Energy is not just the IT side, this is my summary of this, not just IT, but also many of these public policy, economic, and business issues. Um, I want to honor many of the colleagues that I've worked with over many years in this area, especially my close friend, Ron Hoffman and Gay Yee. Uh, we've worked together now for six to eight years on these energy projects. And to some degree, from a grassroots, that's how this center has got started. The center will not have a specific director. It's going to function a little bit like our Berkeley Center and Actuator Group or our Berkeley Wireless Research Center, where there'll be a team of faculty uh, leading the center. And then later on, as the center grows, it's pretty clear that we want to have more than just the IT part, because, up, for example, just up on the fourth floor, uh, Dan Cameron and his students that focus on the renewables, actually, uh, Commissioner, uh, are a big part of this group. And we have controls faculty on that floor. We have people doing... Uh, the uh, human factor side of uh, energy usage. And so you'll see when you move up there, there's a great range. I also wanted to say um, that we're grateful to <coughs> our friends from uh, Golden Power Thermostat, uh, if you just put your hand up for a second, because there are some demos up there this afternoon. And I wanted to say thank you to the many students that are in the room where we have a lot of uh, student posters that you'll also see. I wanted to keep my time limited. And so at this point, I'm going to hand over to my friend Gary, who will tell you a little bit about the mechanism of the day. Thank you. Oh, I can go. You can sit over there. Right. Welcome, everyone. Let me add my welcome to our distinguished guests and to uh, all of you who come to these seminars on a regular basis on Friday afternoon. This one is a little bit different, as you can see, and especially to our industry partners. Uh, part of what we're doing here is in response to inputs that we've received from you. And we're going to, my colleague Damon Yee and I are going to address that a little bit as we go through these very brief comments. As Paul said in his opening comments, Hyper Energy is, uh, has grown out of work that has taken place in the past. It's an evolutionary center, and it is uh, supported by or has partnerships and constituency from three different areas. The Center for uh, the California Institute for Energy and Environment, the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, and of course citrus. And in a way, this three dimension or this three circle diagram mirrors the three elements that we think are necessary to commercialize a lot of the technology that we've been working on over the years and will continue to work on as we evolve. The need for technology, the need for public policy innovations, and the need for business innovations. 
And so think of those, of those three things as you, as you see this symbol. My colleague Gabe McGee and I have been uh, asked to lead from a technical and managerial directorship level, and we are led by and guided by a group of co-directors that Paul Wright just referred to. Their names are listed here, and the attempt here was to, to get a broad multidisciplinary representation both across the campus and because Mary Ann Yet from LDL is there from the lab as well. So we just want to make a very few comments about this before we get into the uh, much more interesting talks a little bit uh, later in the program. <clears throat> As I said a few moments ago, hyper energy is an evolution deriving itself from some excellent work and some other centers that have existed in the past, thanks to the efforts of Lori Tenhope and Ron Hoffman and Martha Rosenfeld at the California Energy Commission. The Demand Response Emerging Technologies Division has evolved into ETD, and there are many, many success stories there, not only in terms of the technology and projects that have been successful, but the students that have gone on to become energy leaders, uh, the uh, companies that have been started, and so forth. And this is just a sample, just a sample of what has taken place. We don't really have space on a slide to show it all. But, but what's changed? What has changed in the environment that brings about the need for a center like I for Energy? There are a couple of things. Looking broadly across Citrus, just within Citrus, the four campuses, there are uh, many opportunities for improving our communications. As my former boss, Luke Platt at Hewlett Packard, once said to me, if HP only knew what it knows, we would be seriously dangerous. And I think that same thing applies to I for Energy. If we only knew what we knew, if we increased communications, that would be a big step forward. The inefficiencies of funding multiple projects without having some sort of central coordinating process are uh, to be noted. And of course, there's always opportunities for greater synergy and collaboration. And so we formed I for Energy to try and address some of these problems with the goal of coming up with better models for sustaining the funding, for reducing the transaction costs involved just in the financial side of all of this research. We obviously have an opportunity to increase our collaborations and synergies and the other things shown on the right side of this slide. I want to, especially for our industrial partners, point out that we are dedicated to making smoother transitions of the technology into the marketplace to your companies and to new companies that will form. We hope that that results in better productivity and timeliness of the research and a bigger impact on society. There is no one in this room needs to know it needs to be told that there is an urgency to the work on energy, and we're very much aware of that as we go forth with this. So we've taken those goals and we've rolled them into three key memorable bullet points. We want to promote the research, obviously, and the communication, and increase the timeliness of the approval and funding processes. We want to maintain the momentum that we currently have, and we want to extend that into the future. Even though energy is a big topic and should embrace both production, distribution, transmission, and use, we're going to focus initially on the demand side. That also is feedback that we received from our industrial partners at a workshop that we held last September. Assemblywoman Skinner, please join us. Thank you. And finally, we listened loudly and clearly to your inputs exactly. on that day, that a partnership with industry is essential to the success of this kind of research. So industry and governmental partnerships are going to be very much in the emphasis as Gaiman and I uh, move forward with, with taking the message out and, and involving more folks in this endeavor. We also listened very carefully when our industrial Participants said, we'd like to have access to better test beds, things that we can't do in-house. You, inside of the university system and inside of uh, Lawrence Lab and other, other places, have access to test beds that we really could make more widely available. And so I've shown on this slide just a few of those that are distributed around the Citrus campuses. There's one there at Lawrence Laboratory that many of you are familiar with and even international relationships that are developing. This one happens to be located in the, the country of Denmark, but with Singapore and with China and other places around the world. We have a wonderful opportunity to involve all of us in those kind of testbed collaborative efforts. <coughs> now, 
Dr. Rosenfeld is going to show this slide in his presentation, I'm sure, and he should, because he's uh, in many ways responsible for that kink in the curve there. As Californians, we should all be extremely proud of the fact that our per capita energy consumption has remained flat since the mid-70s. The U.S. has continued to grow. And so we look at this and take this as basically more than just metaphorical marching orders. We think that as we look out to 2050, that the goals that California has set for itself for greenhouse gas reduction need to be met by dramatically reducing the energy consumption per capita, not only in the state, but nationally. And so we've mirrored the, uh, the uh, thanks to the suggestion of Mike Gravely, we've used the same slope between where we are now and where we need to be in 2050, derived from the greenhouse gas emission uh, directions from California, and we've applied it to this slide. And in honor of Professor Rosenfeld, we've called this the Rosenfeld effect squared. So those are our marching orders. We're serious about it, and we're going to move ahead with that. Now, Damon has a few comments to make about the projects and the successes that have taken place in the past and a few of the directions we're going to go in the future. So I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Damon Eaton, to finish up these brief comments. Great. Thank you, Gary. Well, I call Energy already has a portfolio of research projects. Um, there's too many to, uh, to uh, go over them today, but I've taken a sample sampling of Bible Energy projects, and in particular I focus on um, ones that are funded by the California Energy Commission, because we do have some special guests from the, from the Energy Commission. Um, first project I've shown on top is the a research that is uh, working on enabling technologies for demand response applications, and these technologies are based on MEMS, microelectrical mechanical systems, and I will kind of go through those uh, again later in, uh, in, uh, later in my presentation. Uh, another group is working on sensors to detect failures in underground distribution cables. Uh, the neat thing about these sensors is that, is that you can detect the, the failures without taking the cables out of service. It's very expensive, uh, very disruptive to customers to, to shut down the cable to find out there's anything wrong. Um, another group is working on uh, renewables integration. They're doing modeling and uh, control algorithms for you know, intermittent renewable resources such as wind power. And finally, a, a group is building a test bed in Corey Hall. It's a, a series of, of uh, networked uh, submeters and wired and wireless sensors and, and um, uh, energy management software. And the point of, of this test bed is to determine how and what kind of information you want to exchange be between uh, buildings and the electrical grid. Um, much of UC energy research has have influenced private industry. Again, I'm, I'm only showing a, a representative list. Uh, again, I'm also focused on CEC-funded uh, research. Uh, the uh, top two companies, Azure Technologies and Fredericks Field Controls, are startups. They were started by uh, <coughs> researchers that were from uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, Azure was co-founded by Cliff, uh, I'm sorry, Charles uh, I'm sorry, Charlie Heisinger and Fredericks Field Controls was, was started, uh, co-funded and started by uh, Cliff Fredericks. Um, in the middle, I'm, I'm showing a thermostat. This is a Wi-Fi enabled thermostat. It's made by Radio Thermostat of America. Uh, it uses an interface called USNAP, and, and the USNAP interface uh, uh, connects to a, a, a communication module that's also <coughs> compatible with that USNAP. Uh, the I idea of the USENAP interface was based on research that was conducted here in, at UC Berkeley. A group worked on a reference design for a, a communicating, I'm sorry, a programmable communicating thermostat. And in that reference design, it was recommended that there will be a communications interface. And that interface was adopted by private industry, and that eventually evolved into something that's called USENAP. Now, Golden Power, who is the parent company of Radio Thermostat of America, will be demonstrating this thermostat in the fourth floor later today. And finally, a company called Equifactor. They collaborated with UC researchers and, and in their development of their product offering, which is an adaptive public <coughs> control that optimizes both energy efficiency and demand response in, in your home. Um, in a prior slide, I talked about some of the MEMS technologies that are being developed here at, at Berkeley, and these are the, those technologies. 
a lot of and many of these technologies have, have tremendous commercial potential. The first one on the on the upper right is, is a printable battery. This is a battery that basically uses inkjet technology to, to print the various layers of, of, of the battery. Uh, it is thin, it is flexible, and basically you can print it into any shape that you want. Um, on the upper right hand corner is a passive non-intrusive current sensor. Uh, it allows someone to use this sensor to uh, monitor the energy use of an appliance. The uh, unique thing of this sensor is that you don't need to unplug the wire to install the sensor. You can just sticky tape the sensor onto the appliance cord. On the lower right hand corner is a miniature energy harvester. This particular <coughs> harvester scavenges energy from, from vibrations. And the energy that's scavenged can actually be used to then charge the, the uh, printable battery. And lastly, on the lower right hand corner is the ultra low power radio. This radio is so low powered and it's being developed at the Berkeley Wireless Research Center that you can use the, the, the small amounts of energy that you scavenge from, from the environment. And these could be vibrational energy or even energy from, from ambient lighting. Now, imagine if you integrate it. Let's say the principal battery is a harvester and this ultra low power battery with let's say a, a temperature sensor, you basically have this uh, what I would consider the, the ultimate uh, sensor because uh, it's cheap to buy, it's, it's non scale technology, it's cheap to install, you don't need a wire, you don't need a power wire, you don't need a data wire because it, it's wireless and, it's, and it uses energy from the environment. And even though it has a battery, you don't need to replace it because it charges itself. So it's basically zero maintenance. Now, I4 Energy, the goal of I4 Energy, one of the goals of I4 Energy is to produce uh, new energy professionals and thought leaders. Here is a represent list, representative list of former <coughs> student researchers that are now out in, uh, in the, uh, working in the uh, energy sector. Um, one person of note is Therese Pfeffer. Uh, she has basically come around full circle. She, uh, when she was a student researcher here at UC, CIE managed her research. Now she's joined CIE and she's managing the research that's going, that will be going on in I4 Energy. And we, with those portfolio of energy uh, project, research projects that I4 Energy have, we have dozens of students working on those projects and they are all many of them will be of our future energy professionals and, and thought leaders. And with that, I've concluded a, a very quick uh, introduction of I4 Energy. Uh, I'd like to ask anyone that, uh, to come talk to Gary or, or me with more questions and, uh, and if you want more information. Thank you. As I mentioned before, we have a star-studded array of uh, colleagues here today, and I think somebody who is known for a Rosenfeld effect, it shows up in Wikipedia now, it shows up in a large number of slides. It's on Steve Chu's slide, the uh, current uh, energy secretary. And I think it's really important to stress something that's very Berkeley-centric in the when Dr. Rosenfeld started the first lab on the hill during the 1973 energy crisis, he began a wave of new science and new technology in things like much better refrigerators, much better window coatings, and the DOE2 uh, architectural program, which teaches an architect where to place a house on a site. What was more important, or just as important, as I should say, as the technology, was that that very rapidly came into the state legislation. And then the more advanced states like Oregon and others accepted that as well, and then they eventually became federal regulations. So I think what always excites me when I'm introducing Art is to know that not only is he a wonderful technologist and a wonderful scientist, but he personally has led many of these new legislations across the country, and especially for California, as you'll probably see in one of the uh, slides he showed and you just saw in one of Gary's slides, has kept our consumption uh, flat. So please join me with a warm 
<laughs> round of applause for Dr. Rosenfeld. This is a very special moment for all of us. Thank you. cell phone, I remember to silence it. Good, good, af good afternoon. Um, I only have about 15 minutes, um, so we won't have a question period, but if I say something uh, that doesn't make sense, uh, shove up your hand. I'm, I'm happy to have comments during uh, this discussion. Um, I'm going to talk mainly about two things. One is energy efficiency. Um, Gaiman Yee or, or Paul said, or Gary said, that uh, your advisory committee uh, put energy efficiency high on its list. And uh, incidentally, I'm, I'm going to define energy efficiency later in terms of a slide, but Um, a simple statement is energy efficiency is anything that gives you the services you are used to getting, give you, give you your familiar, familiar services, uh, hot shower and cold beer, um, for less money than it does today. Now, less money, of course, involves some investment up front, but you save on electric bills or gas bills or gasoline bills, and um, the idea is to go in that direction. Um, new innovative supply, which is also uh, carbon dioxide free or global warming gas free, is of course the other half of the problem because uh, energy efficiency won't go, get you all the way, but it'll get you like halfway there. And I want to uh, talk about its successes so far. And then I'm going to talk a little bit, <clears throat> as the commissioner who Fort Worth was for about eight of my ten years at the CEC, um, some of the philosophies of peer funding and how proud we are of all these centers which have sprung up. Um, does anyone see a problem with this picture? Well, um, NASA will tell you, it sh shows you where Western development is. Um, I will tell you that there are two things that make me uncomfortable in landing on an airplane uh, at night at a place like this or in the daytime. Um, in the daytime, on a hot summer day, the sun is beating down, and most of the roofs you look at, uh, instead of being white, as has been known to the Greeks and the pharaohs for three to 5,000 years, are still dark colored and hot and trapping solar energy and heating up the world. Um, at night, these are not lights. This is not light which has fallen from a street light on the pavement uh, and uh, if reflected back up into the airplane. Uh, it's simply badly designed lighting. Uh, in California, we have uh, new lighting standards, outdoor lighting standards. Um, in Midtown, San Francisco, or <coughs> districts that sell cars, for example, it can be as bright as light as you want. But uh, out in the countryside, uh, there are four zones going to one with virtually no light uh, in national parks and so on. Um, but the main thing is that uh, uh, the amount of light which leaks upwards, which is spilled upwards, has to be now less than 6%, and now that the engineers have started paying some attention to it, it's probably less than 1%. So I hope that uh, uh, as these lights become more efficient and dimmer, uh, California and the West Coast will be the first to disappear. Um, Gary and Paul talked about the uh, Rosenfeld effect and the California is doing better than the United States but I want to take a minute to point out how important energy efficiency has been um, in the United States now 
of course, remember we started with uh, uh, a lot of low-hanging fruit on the ground, which we were tripping over. Um, and uh, when the OPEC embargo awoke us in the fall of 1973, uh, we were using just about twice as much fuel per dollar of gross domestic product as were all our competitors uh, in Europe and Germany and so on. Uh, but this is a history of what's happened, and I think it's pretty impressive. Uh, this is a time series from 1949, when, as far back as the Energy Information Agency goes, to 1973, and then on to the present, or nearly to the present. Um, the blue line is what happened. The red line here is following the trend from 49 to 73. Uh, and it, th this is called it's an energy intensity, energy needed to make a dollar gross domestic product. Um, as we get smarter, we learn to use energy more efficiently and we get more efficient fuels too. So uh, energy per dollar GNP had been coming down, but only at about half a percent a year. Um, instead, it came down here with a definitely visible kink. Uh, to make numbers round, uh, in, 19, in 2005, before the recent run-up in prices, um, our, our whole final energy bill, uh, that is, the electricity you pay for at your home or, your, or in this room, uh, the gas you pay for in the home or this room, the gasoline for your car, all that added, added up to $1 trillion. Our economy was $13 trillion, so that's about 7% of everything we spend goes to energy. How much would it have been if we had followed this trend line without thinking about what we were doing? The answer would have been about $1.7 trillion, or six, $700 billion per year, more than we're actually spending. Now, each person has his own view of uh, uh, how to compare $700 billion. It's a lot of money. But just as an example, it's enough every year to support the Defense Department and pay for two wars. So if you wish to think about it, uh, using our brains and our technology and energy efficiency uh, is a pretty significant uh, thing to keep on doing. Uh, that's the effect that Paul showed you, or Gaiman showed you. I'm getting confused, staying confused. Um, I want to... Um, talk a little bit about caveats on this plot. Uh, about one-third of this plot, and I'll show you in a minute, is uh, rock, rock solid conservation. It's uh, building standards, appliance standards, utility rebate standards, and market transformation. Utility rebates, energy efficiency programs, and uh, market transformation. Um, on the other hand, some of it, about a third of it, is that electric prices on the West Coast will know they have water cheap power in Oregon and Washington. Um, uh, electric prices in California are higher than they are in coal burning states. We don't have any coal. Uh, we are not going to make any new contracts for even importing coal by wire. And um, that's about a third of the effect to be explained away. And about a third of the effect is just what I call the Camelot effect. The weather is ideal here. Um, you can build a new house or a new building without much skill uh, to use a lot less energy than it does in Florida where it's stinking hot or Minnesota where I don't want to go now. Um, nevertheless, um, per capita, although our rates are higher, our bills are lower and about uh, $160 per capita that year or $500 per household. And we've avoided spending about that by this combination of standards and so on. Um, if I had a lot of time, uh, which I don't, um, I would say uh, one more thing about this slide and give you some examples. Uh, we've been electrifying a lot during this time. Um, a few years ago, just standby power of all the gadgets that are on in your house uh, sucking electricity like vampires. Um, 
had gotten up to 10% of residential demand, residential load. They're only about three watts each, but they're 30 or so in your house and they're sucking electricity 24 hours a day. Um, we passed standards which turned out not to increase the price enough for anybody to change his price list. Um, the average new one now has to be less than one watt and uh, they're no longer warm to the touch. And uh, I think the average is probably down to a few tenths of a watt. All it took was uh, for a few engineers to go from uh, analog circuits to digital circuits. Uh, so there's been a lot of electrification, which you may, you'd think would make this line grow. But uh, anytime something gets to be over about 10% of uh, commercial demand or residential demand, not automobile demand until recently, um, uh, it tends to get standards first by California and then the feds follow. Uh, as a result of that, refrigerators, which started off at 25% of residential electricity and were on the average 200 watts, are now down to about uh, 40 watts and uh, a, f a few percent of residential electricity. Uh, air conditioning per square foot is down to a quarter. It's down to a half because of better air conditioners and a half because of better designed houses. And we'll go down quite a lot more as we really press for nearly zero energy houses, new houses, that is. The result ends up being flat. Um, I'll skip that. Now, um, what is the third that we really know about? Uh, this is the savings starting in 1990. The programs all started with building standards in 1977 <coughs> was the first building and appliance standards. Um, but is now up to, let's see, today should be marked on this plot and it's not, but it's 2010. It's up to about 50,000 gigawatt hours, which is about 20% of California electricity. So of the 50% that we've avoided, the 20% is well documented and is probably conservative because we assume that every refrigerator goes out of business in 14 years, every car goes out of business in 12 years and so on, which they uh, really, really don't. Um, uh, so I, I think that I want to say once more what really works is to get a big enough commercial availability of better refrigerators, uh, better lights, compact fluorescents, uh, better commercial buildings, um, be better windows, better air conditioners. Uh, utility programs take up, uh, incentive programs take up about the rest. We're now spending one billion dollars a year we, uh, you're, you are now spending about $1 billion a year because you're all electric and gas ratepayers uh, to convince people to buy Energy Star equipment and so on. It works very well. Uh, it's, it's, if you stop to think about it, it's very clever marketing. Um, once every 16 years, um, you want a new refrigerator on the average. And you go and you find there's a good labeling s system with appliance labels. Um, <coughs> you uh, find that you may get an extra rebate beyond Energy Star. Uh, your payback time is brought down to about two years, and you buy the better refrigerator. It beats the standards. Now, uh, at first it sounds like that's a miracle, you're being subsidized, but of course for the remaining 15 years, uh, you're paying to subsidize somebody else. And it's all really very sophisticated marketing. Uh, okay, so, Um, I'm not going to show you refrigerators except for one new thing because I've talked about refrigerators a lot. Refrigerators versus nuclear power. Um, but I will say this. This is the increase in size of refrigerators uh, getting thinner and thinner walls until the embargo when efficiency began to mean something. This is more than a kink. The trend was off like this. 
and instead there was a 90 degree turn and it's back down to a quarter. Uh, good. Uh, what happened to the first cost of refrigerators? Did it go up because we required more, better heat exchangers or more copper in the, in the heat exchanger or magnetic strips on the doors and so on? No, everybody had to redo his assembly lines. They put in all the new tricks when they redid the assembly lines of everything else that had come up in the last 30 years or how long an assembly line for refrigerators lasts. And the price, instead of going up, uh, came down. And this experience has been worldwide. So when people, people talk about um, uh, there's money to be made in new factories and new skills, uh, this, I think, is a fairly interesting example. Uh, that's a slide which says that um, in dollars, the value of refrigerator savings will level off at about $20 billion a year. The value of uh, re energy, wholesale energy sold by nuclear plants is about $20 billion a year. A few more building standards, appliance standards on refrigerators and we'll uh, catch up with nuclear power, except that nuclear power is going to probably get a jolt and uh, do a little growing itself. They should both, we need them both. Um, this is um, recent television standards. Uh, a typical California home uh, uses about uh, 8,000 kilowatt hours a year. Uh, refrigerators right now in 2009, when we passed the standards, made the first draft of the standards, uh, refrigerator, um, televisions were running about 10% of uh, home energy, and so that is required. Attention. It had been flat at about 5% for a long time. This was CRTs, cathode ray tubes. Um, there was only a few per house. They took up a lot of space. And uh, kids only watched them five hours a day. Uh, now uh, come the flat screens. Um, the, the, the radio itself is, isn't any more bigger load than it was before. It's about 25 watts for the television, the guts of the television. It's the big bright screens and the fact that they're about five around the house and you keep, keep accumulating them because you've got space. And the kids watch them seven and a half hours a day. And uh, it needed some attention. And so we passed standards which have become effective here and go on. And uh, I'm sure that the standards will keep them leveled off at something like 10%. Um, that's a plot of uh, the 2011 standards. Uh, these will be, these dogs will go. Um, this is the 2013 standards. This represents about a 25% savings. This represents about a 50% savings. Uh, and the, 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 new, the new good ones don't cost any more than the old ones. This is uh, California Energy Commission lighting standards. Uh, it's hard to believe how about three years ago uh, we were still so timid as to pass lighting standards which were only going to be 5% reduction of the energy of fluorescent, of incandescent lamps. But then uh, the nation has gotten more gung-ho recently and this triggered a federal bill for a, starting in January 2011, uh, lamps sold in California, incandescent lamps now rated at 100 watts will drop to 72 watts. The next year, the 60 watt lamp will drop to 53. The next year, the 50 watt lamp will drop to 43. And the, 20, and the 40 watt lamp will drop to 29. Uh, in January 2018, all of this will disappear and lighting will have to be this is an appliance thing. You, it's, see, it depends on what you see, find at uh, Ace Hardware or Walmart. Uh, we'll go to 45 lumens per watt, which is, which is now uh, the efficacy of compact fluorescence. It's still only a half the e efficacy of long uh, fluorescent tubes, but it's, it's pretty good. Um, final comment. Um, 
I, I'd like to go through this plot in detail, I can't in 15 minutes, but this is a plot of the cost of abating carbon dioxide uh, if we've got between now and 2030 to do it, uh, put out by McKinsey and Company, who've been doing this for the United States, for China, for India, generally mopping up. Um, I want you to see only one thing. All these measures here, and there are 100 or so, um, are measures that save money and don't make much change in how you get your hot water, how you get your miles per gallon, uh, how you get your better efficiency. They save money. But we've got to do more than that. Uh, this is where the investment cost, the annualized investment cost of something is about the same as the bill savings. And then this is new clean supply, which is great, but it's still expensive. What I want you to see is that the area of these two, which represents the amount of money you have to put up, uh, which, which you have to put up here or save here, is within the noise the same. So um, when people tell you that it's going to cost n trillion dollars, uh, that's because the economists are very empirical, and they say, well, this stuff isn't happening, so we'll forget it, which is just the opposite of the message I'm trying to give you and uh, I think has some validity. Uh, so this is what's going to cost us a trillion dollars and take a tenth of a percent a year off of gross domestic product and so on. Even that's rather small considering the issues at stake. But um, uh, I think this is a very important message and I'm, I'm very grateful to McKinsey for doing this. This part of the curve has been around and of this shape for 20 years. But uh, the, the, somebody had the nerve to take all the new stuff and put it on there was uh, courageous and uh, has an important message. Okay, uh, I'm going to quit a few minutes early because uh, your representative, and I need my green notes, Paul. No, I just got to get something out of my pocket. Um, I discovered that uh, there's a meeting at 1 o'clock um, up on the hill with Nancy Skinner to discuss what sort of legislation she should be doing for folks like us next year, and uh, persuaded her easily, I think, um, to come by and say a few words about, uh, to say a few words. Um, Nancy, uh, I've known since she was a graduate student at the University of California, Berkeley, and later on the city council. Um, she's always had uh, environmental interests in efficient use of energy, <clears throat> And in particular, we've um, supported one another in our interests on cool roofs and white roofs as a way to uh, save electricity, air conditioning, make cities cooler, reduce smog because um, instead of reducing feedstocks, which is getting to be expensive, the feedstocks being volatile organic cooking into, with, with uh, combustion products cooking into smog, uh, if you lower the temperature of a city by eight degrees or so, people are more comfortable, but the smog cooks slower. And she's been very active in that. Um, she's written two magnificent bills on that area, and I'll let her talk about others. Um, one is, um, it's fairly easy to sell white roofs because there's a house underneath the roof which is saving electricity. Um, cool pavements, which means concrete color pavements, is a tragedy of the commons, which uh, Nancy has been worrying about. And then, um, uh, that bill didn't get passed last year because the states ran out of money, uh, but it's a two-year bill. Um, she did something very important, which was so important that we managed to find, we, the Energy Commission, uh, managed to do a little lobbying and find stimulus money to get buildings labeled by their electric efficiency. Um, and uh, the states came through with 10 slots to work on this problem. So that's wonderful. Um, and I think I'm going to just cede my five minutes to Nancy. Nancy, oh, I forgot to say, if you don't know Nancy Skinner, <laughs> she is our representative to the State Assembly from Berkeley and other places.
Thank you. I'm very honored to be here, and especially honored that Art asked me, as uh, he is one of my most important mentors. Um, I'm going to give you a little perspective on California energy policy, and I was greatly, greatly privileged to um, be both an undergrad and a grad here at Cal, and in that time to have Art as a professor, also as a, um, as I said, a mentor. Um, because as a grad student, um, I, I helped with a number of other people lobby the city of Berkeley to establish an energy advisory commission. And this was during the late 1970s oil crisis. <clears throat> and our purpose in having the city of Berkeley have an energy commission was to try to motivate the city to um, encourage maximum efficiency, and you know, uh, just a lower lower use of fossil fuels and less dependency on uh, oil and the fossil fuels. And w uh, while I was on that energy commission, Art and some other people well known to Cal, like uh, Carl Bloomstein, who was also on that commission, we wrote some ordinances called Seco and Rico. There, for those of you who follow <coughs> Berkeley, Seco and Rico are pretty well known. And we could put a chart up here. Uh, uh, Art, the famous Rosenfeld effect chart shows how the per capita electricity <coughs> usage in California is so low. Well, the per square footage electricity usage in Berkeley is the lowest of any city in California. And it is so because of partly due to those ordinances. And what those ordinances did was at the time of sale, whenever a property, commercial or residential, changed hands, the owner had to bring the uh, building up to a slightly higher efficiency. So while California has the best building code, Title 24, which we can greatly thank Art for, um, Title 24 only affected older building stock um, if there was a significant remodel. So if you didn't remodel your building stock, it stayed at a low energy efficiency. Well, Berkeley began to upgrade, or we, all of us in Berkeley, began to upgrade ours due to the passage of these um, laws in the early 80s. Since that time, many people have wanted the state of California to do the same so that we could apply our very good energy efficiency building codes to those buildings built pre-Title 24. Um, but most of the efforts in this regard were thwarted. Um, different legislators introduced it, and they were thwarted. But um, I, on, with Art's encouragement, introduced it this last year, and it was AB 758. And we were able to work with the various past opponents and get their support the governor signed it into law, and um, what it does basically is motivate, incentivize, and mandate the same kind of efficiency uh, upgrades and retrofits to all of our pre-Title 24 building stock. So the significance of it is that over time, um, one of the, now I said I was going to give you a perspective on California energy policy. Those of you who have followed the legislature recently have, um, have probably observed that there's been a great debate about how much of our electricity should be generated through renewable sources and how much of a role should the state play in mandating that our utilities uh, procure that you know uh, require a certain amount of our electricity be generated by uh, renewable sources well the legislation to require a 33 percent RPS was not successful this year the governor vetoed it but he did an executive order mandating 33 percent RPS um, and then that was significant both to stimulate um, renewable energy investments in generation, but also to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to lessen our uh, reliance on fossil fuels. But from a greenhouse gas emissions re reduction point of view, if we were to calculate, and again, these are all ideal circumstances, but let us say, and I certainly hope, and I know that it's Art's intent, that we would uh, actually maximize uh, 758 and that we would, over time, achieve it in all existing pre-Title 24 buildings. If, if we do so, the greenhouse gas emissions reduction potential of that is almost equivalent to the GHG um, reduction of the 33% RPS. So I give that as a little slight background, and I'm, I'm not going to talk a lot longer, but I want to then just frame sort of what, what's happening now around energy policy. California has um, do much to... Uh, Visionary people that have both been on our CPUC and on our Energy Commission has had energy efficiency as a priority, 
has also very much tried to stimulate renewable energy. Um, and we have various <coughs> policies, legislation, load orders, and things like that in place to do so. But if you think kind of, while we've not codified this anywhere in law, what we are really doing is that we are trying to encourage and uh, facilitate and urge the transition to a low-carbon economy and to affect to transition off of fossil fuels. Now, that may take a very, very long time, but in, as we do so, we are also trying to wring the maximum amount of energy or productivity out of each unit of energy that we use, whether it's a fuel, a kilowatt hour, a therm, whatever it is, right? And so we do that through things like efficiency, like the appliance standards that um, are described or the building codes, but we also do it through the avoidance. And the cool roofs, cool pavements are, you know, not what you would consider the standard efficiency in that they're not like a technological fix to a TV so that that TV, when it's plugged in, uses less energy, but rather they are a design of a building or the design of our streetscape such that our communities are cooler and thus when our communities or homes or buildings are cooler, we don't need as much electricity, we don't need to use the air conditioner as much. So there's these multiple kind of strategies and this, we rely so much on you, programs like Citrus, programs like all the research at L and LBNL, programs like at ERG, programs all through this campus that are doing the kinds of research to bring products, technologies, and concepts, because much of this is intellectual property, basically to market so that we can accomplish those goals. And that's, uh, we need it. The state has tried to encourage it, and in some cases, like in things like the peer grants and in support for, say, Citrus, we've actually provided some funding for it, but in general, you'll see less of that now. And you'll see less of it because of the economy, and when the economy is in this kind of recession, the state has less funds, so the state's going to be less in terms of its dollars, but we will still, I hope, try to be very consistent in our policy direction so that we send the right policy signals to drive the kinds of markets to support the kinds of research that you all are doing and bring those products and intellectual capacity to bear. Um, so that kind of wraps it up. I've, I'll just say as a final sort of editorial note, we have an interesting AB 32, our Greenhouse Gas Emissions Reduction Law or our Global Warming Act, is motivating a lot of um, you know, new products, new investment in California, green jobs, clean technologies, clean energies. But we have an attack right now on that, and there's going to be an effort to try to repeal it on the basis that it's hurting our economy. And I think those that have followed the economic indicators would, would at this moment say that that's the, it's the opposite the case. Um, but that's one of the things we're going to have to be up against. And then as we continue to try to codify certain things, like if we actually put into place a 33% RPS, are, what are the unintended consequences? Are we somehow then lessening our commitment to energy efficiency since while well, right now it's only really codified in the load order of our utility procurement? So those are some of the things to think about and I'll stop there and I'm really um, happy to uh, be able to address you and uh, always welcome your ideas uh, to my office. Thank you very much indeed, Arthur and Nancy. Our next distinguished speaker, please welcome Mike Gravely, who's the leader of our peer work, and I wanted to wish him a special welcome to the Berkeley campus. Uh, his program has led many of the important research topics that we've been leading on campus, and I look forward to uh, working with him for many years to come. Mike Gravely. Well, thank you all, and uh, I have to be honest, I just run a, a part of the peer program. I'm not in charge of the whole peer program, but I am in charge of the areas that fall majority in this particular research. Uh, I also am very uh, excited about the concept of I4 Energy, and so uh, what I want to do is talk a little bit about some of the uh, past research that we've done that you'll see some of the demonstrations for later today, and also talk a little bit about the um, upcoming opportunity that... Uh, that I see in, in this area, in particular for student research and future growth.
For those that aren't familiar, just briefly, the PEER program is a program that's been around for more than 10 years. We get about a little over $80 million a year uh, in research funds for both natural gas, electricity, and we work in the transportation sector also. Uh, we have a heavy focus on energy efficiency, low carbon science and technologies, and we also do a lot of area for collaborations for centers like this. We actually currently manage, I believe, 12 active centers <coughs> that the PEER program uses to, to uh, with different universities to, to, to develop and share and research. Uh, I think the concept here, and what I want to focus on is the four concepts here of information, integration, intelligence, innovation. I think it's a great uh, way of looking at things. I think it has a very appropriateness for today. I think those that have heard the president's speech this week and everything else, it's very exciting to be in, a, in an area that's so important to the country. Uh, the president has mentioned that he sees clean technology as a way for the U.S. to again gain our role in the world as a leader. And I think you'll see that uh, both uh, the research and certainly this institution has the ability to start doing that. Uh, when we look at information, <clears throat> I want to share with you some projects we've done in the past. Uh, here's two examples that we've worked through uh, the program here. One of them is a, a DR BizNet. And so what it is about is information transfer. What it does, and it's a program that's developed us in a commercialization phase now, and so using demand response and using it effectively is not as simple as it might seem. One is integrating all the different customers that are uh, dropping their load. Two is for the utility to be able to understand which customers are on the load and when they call the load that the customer responds. The California ISO needs to know when uh, they uh, call for a load drop that they'll get what they call for. And so together, uh, this is a program that I'm, I think I probably first met Gaiman a while back when he was working this, was uh, a program where they've actually developed software to help the utilities and to help the customers in the whole process of signing up, managing, reporting, tracking, getting paid incentives, and everything to make demand response much more manageable. And ultimately, in California, we want demand response to be a resource just like generation is, and so we can plan for it and we know what it is, and it's a resource that we want to use the maximum we can, uh, can work with. On the right side, it just shows, again, an information transfer. In this case, it's technology. How can we communicate throughout buildings? How can we communicate effectively? You saw some of the technology here. You'll see it again this afternoon. Very, very inexpensive, very productive technology, doing research about how these technologies can communicate, what the range are, what the range of different technologies, different batteries, different communication frequencies. And so what it does for us is it gives us the technical ability to pass that communication information around and share that information and get it back to the decision points. Integration is what we'll hear a lot about today in addition to this side, but also it's a key area that, I, that my office works on. Here I just want to say that we have to look at integrating the demand side, at the customer side, the, the large commercial buildings, and also industrial. Uh, and also looking at this lower pictures talks about how those loads and how those demand side loads fit into the bigger picture. How can demand side loads be managed at the transmission level as generation? How can they be responsive to the needs of the load in very, very fast times so that they can be the maximum value? On the right, when you look at those pictures, the left, it's a kind of a simple diagram, but when you add things like PV, electric vehicles, plug-in hybrid, uh, plug hybrids, uh, fuel cells, uh, other types of technologies, into a picture and then more manage it all in one area. Here is we're integrating it all from all three levels. The demand side, the, the distribution side, and transmission side becomes very critical. So that communications architecture, that uh, opportunity to apply the right resource at the right time. Ultimately for California, we want to meet our needs without having to add more and more and more power plants. We want to be able to use our load effectively. We want to have lower peaks and we want to use more of the energy at night when it's cheaper and easier to, to obtain, especially with wind. Intelligence, this is another area where I think the President's been very clear on. The United States needs to increase our, our, our intellectual base. We need to have more students in science and engineering. We need to have more entrepreneurs. We need to have more innovators. And certainly this is a university that focuses on that. And we're certainly proud to be able to provide opportunity for students to do practical research and for professors to expand their research and for companies to take that research and, and make it commercial. So we will see uh, many other areas like that. I failed to mention earlier that uh, in the information side, we just signed a contract with another part of Berkeley yesterday 
uh, to look at the information transfer for Clean Energy Workforce Center, a national workforce center that we'd hope would be in California. But one of the questions we run into very rapidly is those of you who are tracking the uh, American uh, Recovery and Reinvestment Act are of funds. There's a substantial amount of money California has gotten and the country has gotten for workforce development. There's, there's probably hundreds if not thousands of efforts going on. What we don't have is a vehicle to be able to share that information, to share best practices, to share curriculum, to share needs, to share future loads, opportunities, so that the, the uh, workforce is trained for the job of the future and they're not trained for technology that doesn't exist in the future. So we'll be working with one of the other Berkeley centers here to actually do the research to determine how that center should be formed, what it should focus on, what the goal of before the end of the year, hopefully forming a center such as like that in California. Here again, we support uh, the research that you'll see here, and we're very proud to share both here. We've done it at the commission. Uh, also, the students here come out and speak and talk about the work they're doing, both graduate and, and, po and postdoctorate. And so I think it's a great opportunity to be able to build that intellectual base and show the rest of the country how to do that. Innovation is another area that uh, these programs are very good of. In the, in the lower right, it looks like an old-style definition, but we had a very large effort at one time of trying to understand whether or not a communicating thermostat was, in fact, possible. And we did some research here with the laboratories. Quite a few people here were involved in this project, and we actually demonstrated the project could be built at a reasonable cost. And as a result of that, there are many commercial products on the market that now can form this opportunity. The other side is just showing you the miniaturization of the whole spectrum of using energy storage, low power radios, and you heard a little bit about this earlier from Game, and I'm sure we'll see some of this uh, in, the, in a little while. But innovation is a real key, and I think the whole concept of the I-4 is what I want to look at as we go into the future. Uh, those of you who know that California is leading the country right now in the integration of renewables, this is a chart I actually saw from a, uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Christina Johnson's presentation about a week ago. But it, it's, it explains and shows visually something that those of us that work the grid have seen and understand for a long time. And that is the grid lights on the upper left, they like generators to come on and run. And they like when it goes up at a nice slow pace and comes down at a nice smooth pace. And when you're doing classical that we've used for hundreds of years, it works. As you start to integrate renewables, you can see as you integrate 10% or 15%, it has an impact, but it seems to be more manageable. But when you get to 33% where we are today, you don't have any steady bases anymore. And what you end up doing is you require some of these very inefficient uh, and, and very polluting uh, generators to run up and down to keep up with the load. The creativity we need, the innovation we need is, in it, is, is demand response, storage, energy efficiency, new types of, of alternative generation, uh, electric vehicles, all those things together and integrated together so that we can go back to a picture that looks on the right and the variations are more predictable and the ISO has technologies and energy they can call on in seconds, not minutes or hours. And if we do that, we can integrate 33% renewables and maybe in the future much higher levels of renewables and still maintain the reliability we need. So this is an area where there's a wealth of opportunity for research, for opportunity and innovation. You've seen this chart a couple of times before, but basically what it shows is the CO2. If we, the top line just shows you is what would happen with CO2 growth if we did nothing. This is considered what they call a wedge definition. So each little area shows you different technology approaches, different, different ways of reducing CO2. And you'll notice that the energy efficiency and um, the um, Low carbon generation are two of the biggest areas. But what I want to show here is, one, we have a very, very aggressive challenge to look and see. You saw the straight line, but not only do we have to do a straight line, as you saw earlier from Paul's presentation, we have to drop our use. And so we need innovative solutions. We need innovative products. We need creative thinking. And we need products today in the future that we can't envision today. And so we're hoping for a center like this and research like this to come up with those technologies. Certainly there's some really exciting things going on here, and we want to see those uh, be not only demonstrated, but commercialized. The last thing I want to point out is the very unique opportunity we live in today. Uh, the president and the uh, ARA program is putting a lot of money out. One of the unique areas is the smart grid area. This is just showing California that uh, the peer program is supporting probably uh, 30 to 40 different uh, 
demonstrations and projects. We're investing 30 to 35 million dollars, and we're getting back 1.3 billion dollars in, in actual DOE funds, customer shared funds, and our funds. And also, you can see the large number of uh, and the diversity of the people we're working with. As I mentioned, uh, we just started a contract recently with uh, another part of the university. One of the future areas I'll be talking with Gaiman about is, and I'll let Pedro Gomez raise his hand here, because he's our technical team lead for this area. We need to integrate all these projects. We need to understand. We need to share the information. We need to look at the innovation. We need to look into the future. And when this, this money is all going to be spent in the next two to five years, and if you were to add to this number carbon sequestration, efficiency, renewable incentives, that would be close to $3 billion in California. And the interesting thing about this, unlike a lot of areas for recovery where the money is going to save jobs, to stop plants from closing down, all this money is going for innovation. All this money is going for new products. All this is going for new technology. So we have an opportunity to make a monumental leap forward. And, and we want to be part of that, and we're expecting to use this center as part of our effort to understand, first of all, what all is going on, how do we integrate what that's going on, how do we help them, how do we look at California and help California make decisions in the future. One of our goals and one of the fears in a market like this, when you have such a large insertion of, of technology, is a couple years from now there's going to be a big cliff when the money starts to dry up. And, and, and what we've got to find is the technologies that are promising. California wants to be the hub of the future. We make those projects to, uh, commercial, and we demonstrate how to do that, and then those companies sell their products nationally and internationally. And so we want to be part of that transition, part of the research that we'll be doing here. We'll be looking at that three to five years out and trying to make projections of which products, which technology, which areas have the most promise for commercial stability, and we want to make that happen. The last thing here is just to show you that uh, this is just a quick collage of some of the different technologies, many of them that you'll see here today, many of them are maybe a little bit larger scale than this, this center will be working on, but there's a wide range of technologies, a wide range of options, and the concept of being able to share the information, to, to use the intellectual properties to share and make some creative thoughts, to be able to integrate this information and share that is, and be innovative in the solutions is going to make a big difference. We, we have a very unique opportunity uh, that we haven't seen, certainly in my life, and I think it's going to be uh, a very unique opportunity there. So I do think what they've done here has been a, a, a very timely um, opportunity. We, we like, at the peer program, we very much like to work with centers such as this to help us understand where we should be focused in the future, to provide opportunities for students that are here to do uh, work here to provide opportunity for companies to come in and see this technology and commercialize it and, and to work there. So we, we envision the establishment of a long-term relationship uh, with this center as we go forward and uh, look forward to that. So I'll be glad to answer questions during the commercial, I mean, during the upstairs if anybody has any questions. We're running a little behind. Mike, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Sure. We, we, we are honored to have representatives from each of the three constituent organizations that are part of I for Energy. And in the last 15 minutes or so, we'd ask each of, these, each of these distinguished guests to say a few words in support of the center, or hopefully in support, or anything else that you would like to say. So why don't we start with Carl Brown, who is from CIEE, and just move down the table. Carl, and then Jeff, and then Ashok. And gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today. Carl. Thank you, Gary. Uh, good afternoon. I'm very excited to be here today representing the California Institute for Energy and Environment as we join with our partners Citrus and Berkeley Lab in showcasing the new I for Energy Center. I have some brief remarks on why CIEE is supporting the center, including some personal remarks on what's exciting and who's involved. Over its 20-year history, CIE has supported public interest energy research in California by providing a portal to the entire UC system, by building multi-institution research teams, and by serving as a catalyst for new energy research initiatives. The I for Energy Center really embodies that spirit with its multi-campus blend of world-class R&D expertise and bold initiatives using information technology to solve energy problems. I continue to be impressed by the excellence 
you know, the students, the faculty, and the staff already working on the I for Energy Center initiatives. And over the years, what we have observed is that the center model allows these three great resources of the university to synthesize their efforts into the most productive R&D enterprises. Now, what's, what's exciting? From my own perspective as, as leader of CIEE's Energy and Buildings Program, I'm really encouraged to observe the keystone of the I for Energy approach is uh, test beds in campus buildings, test beds for energy information technology. I've been involved in the development of the test beds at Merced, Berkeley, and Berkeley Lab, and I know that there are similar great opportunities at Davis and Santa Cruz. Test beds really provide a valuable synergy between the university's academic and facility resources. They ground the research and development in real world environments, and they enable the uni university to be at the leading edge of energy resource management and climate protection. <coughs> so finally, uh, who's involved? We're really fortunate to have built such an accomplished director team for the new center. I want to give special recognition to my longest acquaintance on the team, Berkeley Lab's Mary Ann Piet. She's been doing pioneering research on building energy information systems since the 1990s, research that has now led to the new paradigm of monitoring-based building commissioning becoming established in mainstream utility energy programs. I've also had the privilege of working with Jeff Wright on the UC Merced Campus Living Laboratory, as well as with Paul Wright and Dave Keller on similar efforts on the Berkeley campus. I've been impressed over the years with my colleague Damon Yee's leadership for enabling technologies development, and I've recently enjoyed working with Gary Baldwin on several exciting research proposals. Now, though our work together is yet to develop, I'm already enjoying stimulating discussions with my newest acquaintances on the director team, Duncan Calloway and Mike Hanneman. So I conclude that we're putting the I for Energy Center in very capable hands with today's dedication. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I completely abandoned my manners. I should have first, before I can roll the clock back, thank Mike for those very, very informative and stimulating and encouraging comments. So Mike, thank you very much. And, and uh, Carl is the deputy director of CIEE, and, and uh, Carl Bloomstein, his is the director of CIE couldn't be with us today, but Carl, that was that was a wonderful set of comments. Thank you. Jeff Wright is the uh, former dean of engineering, the founding dean of engineering at UC Merced, and Jeff, uh, we, we'd welcome your comments as well. Jeff represents Citrus today. Well, thank you, Gary, and, and I thank the panelists. Um, as I'm thinking about the the comments we just heard, and uh, as I look at the distribution of people in this audience, I'm starting to think, Gary and. Paul, this is a really good idea of what we're doing here. <laughs> you didn't think so. <laughs> it's, it's been a long year, and it's been ups and downs, and we've had some workshops, and we've had uh, a lot of discussion about this, but this is really a good idea. Particularly, Mike, your comments. I, I think we're right to the point about why the way we've configured this and what we're trying to accomplish here is, is really on point. Um, I'm also thinking about something that happened yesterday, uh, so I'm sort of deferring from my uh, prepared comments, we had a meeting in this room yesterday, as Paul alluded to, that was to discuss sort of the aftermath of the Copenhagen meeting. We had some great presentations, and, and all, all were very on point. But one in particular was particularly relevant for what we're talking about here, and that was Dean Edley of the, of the uh, law school. Uh, and he was sort of extolling, uh, encouraging the research community to do a better job of, of bringing the fruits of our labors into practice and, and uh, policy making and uh, sort of scolding us that we hadn't done a good enough job of reaching out. He made three points, and I think three points that are particularly well suited for what we're doing here today. The first point was with the complexity and the urgency of trying to transform this energy economy, uh, we need to do a better job of interacting and bringing our research to influencing the decision-making process. And, and in particular, he said, we can't expect decision-makers, um, I think he referred to them as knuckleheads, uh, he did. We, can't, we can't wait for decision-makers to reach out to us. We, the research community, need to 
be better at reaching out to decision makers. Um, and I think he's exactly right about that. The second point he made uh, was made in a very eloquent way, particularly for a lawyer. He said that the membranes uh, between disciplines at Berkeley are more porous than any in the world. And and what a remarkably good way for a lawyer to state that. But I think it's absolutely true, and certainly he has the, the vision and the experience to be able to relate that to other institutions. I think what we're doing here is extending that even further with a partnership that we're building, um, and particularly with the other campuses, the labs, uh, and our stakeholders that we're trying to partner with, which sort of emphasizes the third point. And the third point is for us to be successful, we collectively in this country about making this transformation, we need to shift governance and the effectiveness of governance at all levels. And I think the way we're configuring I4E with our corporate sponsors, our corporate partners, with our governmental linkages, uh, with our academic linkages, I think we have real potential here for really influencing the way governance happens. Uh, not only at, uh, at the larger levels, but even at the grassroots levels. And that's particularly important for us, UC Merced in the Central Valley, where we're trying to work with organizations that are trying to really do this at the grassroots level. And I think I4E can have an impact there. So I go back to my initial statement. I think we've got a good idea here. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jeff. And finally, Dr. Uh, Ashok Gadgil, who is uh, both a professor here on campus and is the acting director of the EETD division at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. Ashok, thank you very much for coming today. It's my pleasure, Gary. Thank you. I speak on behalf of uh, both Environmental Energy Technologies Division and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab uh, that we're absolutely delighted to support the the founding and opening of I4 Energy. Uh, this is a tremendous opportunity. Uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab for a long time, for decades, has had uh, extraordinarily good integration with some departments on campus, physics, for example, or chemistry, material science, uh, but not so good with many departments in the College of Engineering. And that recognition has been there uh, for the last four years or so at LBL leadership. An appointment of Professor Arun Majumdar as the Director of Environmental Energy Technologies Division was a very conscious step in trying to open that channel between College of Engineering and the Environmental Energy Technologies Division, which most closely maps with the College of Engineering interests. Uh, so, so this really is a, is a very conscious effort from LBL side to try to work closely with campus because we recognize there's tremendous leverage uh, to be gained by, by pairing with campus and we haven't really exploited the synergies between College of Engineering and LBL uh, in energy research in particular. So I for Energy provides that venue. I'm really delighted uh, to see this founding and, and delighted to support it. Lastly, I would just want to add uh, one little point. Uh, LBL up on the hill is now more than $700 million a year research institute, driven primarily by scientific curiosity. Just science, curiosity-driven science, okay? Uh, but for the first time, LBL now has stated in public that one of our highest priorities is to address through invention and innovation the threat of global climate change and bring under control runaway increase in CO2 in the atmosphere. So you will hear more and more about this in the coming weeks and months and years, but this enormous institution which was essentially just curiosity-driven scientific innovation, is now turning its extraordinary intellectual force to pay attention to carbon. And it's, it's, the initiative is called Carbon Cycle 2.0 because Carbon Cycle 1.0 is the natural photosynthetic 
carbon cycle that uh, Melvin Kelvin cracked uh, at Berkeley. And now we need to crack carbon cycle 2.0, the, the anthropogenic carbon cycle, which we need to bring under control. Okay? So I4 Energy is, is, I mean, the founding of I4 Energy is, is just perfect in terms of how we need to work with campus, how we need to bring invention, innovation, and tech transfer to actually bring this runaway carbon growth under control. And we look forward to this. Thank you very much. Thank you. I wanted to thank everybody for coming, especially our distinguished panelists, Mike Gravely, Carl Brown, Jeff Wright, and Ashok. Looking around the audience today, I'm very grateful that you all stayed for so long. I did want to say uh, a couple of things about special people in the room. Uh, Professor Pat Manti is here today. He is the director of Citrus at UC Santa Cruz. I wanted to thank him for coming. Uh, there are other distinguished people in the room, and I'm in danger of missing someone out, but I do want to say our good friends from PG&E are here. Thank you, Chris Knudsen, for coming. Uh, friends from industry, I see Karen Hartzell from uh, Sun Microsystems right there, just behind Ken Goldberg. Uh, other people from the lab are looking in this middle section. Uh, uh, Dean Al Pisano is here. Thank you very much. And many distinguished colleagues just in front of him, uh, Costas, uh, Cameron Square, others. And um, what's really interesting when you look at this group is that it's a huge group. I mean, and then there's Jim Edwards from Material Science, the, uh, our, our battery expert. So we have a huge range of people in the room, Charles Glorioso from industry, and uh, I just saw Ram come in from Santa Cruz. So it's a really lovely mixture of people. I'm in danger of getting a little over-emotional here, uh, <laughs> so I'm going to sign off and hand it over to Gary, who's going to do a rather military operation of getting everybody to the cake-cutting ceremony as fast as possible without the elevators breaking down. So I uh, thank you all for coming today, and please come up and cut the cake in this uh, somewhat frivolous moment. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. So we do have a troop movement challenge now. Those of you that are going to join us, and I hope that's everyone in the room, there are three ways that we would like you to ascend 